Baker, who is the Wickham Professor of Logic at New College in Oxford. His research, research focuses primarily on epistemology, logic, metaphysics, I'm sure you all know, and philosophy of language. He's a fellow of the British Academy and of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. He has published many major philosophy books, including Vagueness, Identity and Discrimination, Knowledge and Its Limits, and many more. Tonight, Professor Williamson will be answering the question, is good philosophy bad science? So without further ado, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Professor Williamson. Issues about what we should uh, value in, in philosophical uh, theories. And uh, the way that I'll do it is I'll talk about a bit uh, about the way philosophers, um, maybe analytic philosophers, tend to uh, think. And then um, I'll compare that to the way scientists think about it quite similar issues and, um, and suggest that we actually have something to learn from the way that scientists uh, do and that maybe we could be um, doing philosophy a bit better than we are at the, uh, the moment. So uh, to begin with, I, I want to talk about the, um, just the idea of uh, flexibility in a theory. I mean, flexibility sounds like a very good uh, thing. and. Uh, you know, it seems like uh, surely a, a flexible theoretical framework is better than an inflexible one. And um, it, the way that, that in science that would be discussed is in terms of um, degrees of freedom. Um, and, and so that would be the idea that, that um, more degrees of freedom are better. And that, that also, I think to a philosopher, sounds pretty commonsensical, because surely uh, freedom is a good uh, thing. And I think that's closely connected with the, the big role that you've probably seen that, um, that, that counterexamples play in analytic philosophy, that a lot of it is driven by you know, theories that we put, somebody puts forward, and then somebody provides a counterexample to them, and then they get uh, modified. And, uh, and so it seems like having you know, flexible theories that it's quite easy to uh, to modify um, seems like an, an advantage because it's, it's going to help us um, take account of uh, counterexamples. Um, and I mean, one area where you can you can see that operating is is when um, people talk about uh, alternative uh, logics, where they suggest that there's there's something. Uh, wrong with uh, standard classical uh, logic because you know, there's, there are some in the area of some kind of paradoxes they suggest that there are counterexamples uh, to it. And, uh, and then one way that it's very common that um, philosophers and, and some logicians um, handle these is uh, by giving themselves more flexibility by um, allowing that the kind of uh, models uh, that we that we use, um, where you know, a, a, a logic is supposed to um, preserve truth from premises to conclusion in all models or something like that, where, where they suggest introducing new types of models that, that um, some non-standard kind as were to um, free things up. So, and and the effect of introducing more of these models of, of different types is usually to weaken the logic, because if the logic's meant to be truth-preserving uh, uh, overall models, then when you introduce new types of models, it typically that just has the effect of making some previous, some arguments that previously would have been counted as valid, invalid, because, because they, they break down in these uh, models. Um, and, um, and, you know, I think, but of course, in outside logic, you can also see um, kind of examples playing a big role where people put forward, you know, an analysis of knowledge or an analysis of causation or of meaning or uh, 
uh, free will or whatever it is, and then people give counterexamples, and then and then you know you, you typically you complicate the analysis a bit to get around the counterexamples, and then somebody produces more counterexamples, and that process uh, goes on. Um, one particular area that I, I'm going to uh, to talk about, um, which, which I think is quite a good test case. Um, has to do uh, with um, what you, you may have heard of uh, called the, um, the hyper-intentional uh, revolution. So uh, let, I'll, I'll explain um, what that is. I'll, I mean, I would prefer to call it the hyper-intentional attempted coup um, <laughs> rather than revolution. But, uh, um, so there's a, a kind of doctrine which was very dominant in analytic philosophy from roughly from um, Saul Kripke's naming the necessity for several decades, which we, we can call uh, intentionalism. Um, and uh, I mean, there are various different forms of it, but the but roughly speaking, um, it's it's saying that. Um, the idea is that that necessarily uh, necessary equivalents, um, things which are nece necessarily, you know, for example, statements which necessarily have the, the same truth value. Necessary equivalents are um, intersubstitutable um, uh, for metaphysical purposes. So what what that um, means um, is that if you if you've got two statements which are um, you know m maybe structured differently, um, but um, but are never, nevertheless are, are necessarily equivalent. Like you know, for example, any two mathematical uh, truths are necessarily equivalent. That the idea is that metaphysically. Um, th there's no, there's no real difference between them. I mean, they're different representations, but as well, the, the condition in the world that's being represented uh, is the same, and so it doesn't matter metaphysically which one um, you're uh, talking about. Um, so, so as where if we have, you know, necessarily a if and only if b, then then we can just substitute a for b and vice versa. When we're talking about metaphysics, and it shouldn't make any. Uh, difference and th this was the the sort of dominant way of thinking about a lot of metaphysical issues post uh, naming and uh, necessity. But it, in the 1990s, uh, it uh, came under a, a lot of uh, pressure, uh, particularly from um, Kit uh, Fine. So you know the, the kind of famous uh, sort of example that that he used was. But Kripke had been talking about, um, I mean, he'd kind of re rehabilitated the idea of the essence of an object. Um, but he'd done it in completely uh, model terms. In other words, what was essential to it had to do with what uh, was necessary to it. And so if things are necessarily equivalent, they're going to have, uh, they're going to play the same role in uh, talk about essences. But um, Fine gave, uh, examples like this, that it uh, is essential to uh, Socrates that he is Socrates. I, I mean, it's, which, it, that's supposed to, I mean, that's kind of, you know, pretty much truly true, but, um, hold on. Um, but then if you, if you take the claim it is essential to Socrates um, that he is a member of um, singleton Socrates. That singleton Socrates is just a set whose one member is Socrates. Um, that, that doesn't seem right. Um, because 
well, you say it's essential to Socrates that he's a member of the table of Socrates. I mean, you know, a, a kind of natural reaction is, well, that is really to do with this, the essential nature of Socrates because it's bringing in something completely extraneous, which is this uh, set. And, and so, you know, the, 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 with, with examples like that, which seem to have different truth values, um, suggest that there's something wrong with intentionalism because um, if you look, we've got these sentences, he's Socrates, and he's a member of Singleton uh, Socrates, which are actually necessarily uh, equivalent to each other, because um, being Socrates is a necessary and sufficient condition for being a member of Singleton Socrates. And so we've got one of these claims from the other by substituting things that are necessarily equivalent, but it, that seems to have taken us um, from something true to something false. So that seems like on the face of it, a counterexample to um, to intentionalism, and um, and I mean, an enormous amount of work over the, the past quarter century has been kind of piling on to this what's called hyperintentionalist view that there are lots of differences which are which are not um, intentional differences. There's no difference as were just in terms of whether necessarily. A can only be, but yet there's some kind of crucial difference, um, as in this case. And then people have been forced to devise new kinds uh, of, of models to explain what's uh, going on here that are sensitive to these um, differences between things that are never, nevertheless necessarily uh, equivalent. Um, and, uh, and, you know, you've probably heard some stuff about. Um, grounding and fundamentality and so on. And, and a lot of that uh, is to do with uh, these kind of hyper-intentional distinctions and how, how we're going to uh, draw them in, in a systematic uh, way. So, so that's an example of the kind of counter-example driven methodology that I've uh, been talking about because you know, w w what was supposed to be the, um, you know, with many, many, many people think really is, the, the killer for intentionalism was just examples like this. Um, not, not some more general theoretical argument, but simply killer counterexamples. Okay. Um, and, and so the, the kind of move that people have been making uh, in response to these <laughs> examples is, in effect, what a scientist would describe as helping themselves to more degrees of freedom. They're allowing, uh, as it were, that, that you can uh, more flexibility into the models so that they can account for differences, which the, the more traditional kinds of models, which were just concerned with possible worlds and things, uh, couldn't, couldn't make any sense of. Because you know, in terms of possible worlds, he's Socrates and he's a member of Singleton Socrates uh, are, are there's no difference between them because they're, they're true in exactly the same uh, possible uh, world. Okay, so that's a kind of philosophical methodology that I want to uh, consider. And, and now I'll say something about the way that uh, that looks uh, to, uh, to scientists. Um, so, I mean, you, you know, an initial expectation might be that scientists would be completely on board with this kind of methodology in principle because, or I mean, it's not exactly to do with observation and so on, but after all, it seems like, you know, don't we have falsification in science where a scientist puts forward a, uh, a universal generalization and then it gets refuted because we find a kind of example because we do an experiment, you know, the, the scientist says that all S to G's and then, and then somebody, you know, all swans are white and then, and then somebody finds a black swan and then that's a kind of example and, and so science has to uh, progress to take account of that. Um, and and that, that would be, you know, some version of um, a, kind of falsificationism in that's associated with Karl Popper in the philosophy of uh, science. Um, but actually, that's an extremely naive way of thinking about what's going on in 
science. And one kind of warning of that is that scientists do not think that increasing the degrees of freedom, by making things more flexible, is a good thing to do. They think that um, it's a, a sign of very bad science um, when people are just freely helping themselves to, to more and more uh, degrees uh, of uh, freedom. Um, and so let me explain what's going on there, because it's, it's not that these scientists have somehow been influenced by postmodernism and they, you know, that they think that um, kind of examples don't matter because truth is, is exploded or something like that. It's, it's something actually much more uh, sophisticated. I mean, a kind of an initial part, the first pass would simply be that they would agree that you know, if somebody's put forward a law, a, a proposed law that for all F's are G's, and then you, if you can find an F that isn't a G, then that does refute it. But you have to be careful because um, the fact that, you've, that you think you've seen an F that isn't a G um, doesn't automatically mean that you're right. I mean, it's possible for observations uh, to go wrong. And, and so if we just had a methodology where as soon as somebody you just find an F that wasn't a G, we just uh, threw the theory out of the window because we had a counterexample to it, there would be a danger of, um, of as it were, treating as refuted and um, pushing off the table forever theories that were in fact true and where the mistake was in the observation, not uh, in the theory. Um, and, and so the, as, just a simple-minded method of uh, using counterexamples um, is not satisfactory from a, a scientific point of view because we need some kind of more critical attitude to the, the data. Um, and there's actually something interesting going on here beyond that, which, which has to do with a, a phenomenon that sounds quite paradoxical when you first hear of it, which is called, uh, called overfitting. Um, and so where the, the, a theory is fitting too closely to the data. And you might think, that, but that's crazy because isn't it the job of the theory to explain the data and so the closer it is uh, to the data, the, uh, the better. But what's going on is, is this, that the, the scientists, that they get a whole lot of um, measured uh, data points. Um, you know, the, let's see. And, um, and what they're trying to do is to, um, to, to fit those data points with a, a, a curve, which you know, will correspond to a mathematical equation, which will be part of the scientific uh, theory. Um, and the thing is, if you give yourself enough degrees of freedom, if you're, which is really to say if you give yourself enough adjustable par parameters, um, uh, you can always find a curve that exactly fits the, the, or any data points that you happen to have. I mean, because you can have a curve that you know, goes sort of, you know, like oops, <laughs> some, some kind of really curve like, like that, which perfectly fits um, the, the data points. And, and so, you know, it, it's, a, it's a much better fit than if you were just to, um, to draw, as it were, a straight line, you know, roughly like that. Um, but what, what scientists have found through bitter experience is that if you go in for that methodology where you, um, you get uh, more and more complicated equations, in order to fit um, the data uh, points uh, exactly. I mean, if you, if you, if you know some maths, it, it's just a matter of the degree of the poly polynomial. The, the more data points you have, the higher the degree of the polynomial you expect to 
need in order to fit the, the, these data points. Um, exactly. But, oh, thank you. Um, what happens is, although you get a, a perfect fit with the data points that you uh, it have at the point where you devise the equation, as soon as you get some more data, there will be a horrible mismatch because you know maybe maybe the equation that you've got will just go off down there, whereas the next day, data point is you know up there. Um, and so, if if you follow a methodology of trying to get a perfect uh, fit uh, between the the equation, the theory, and and the data, what you actually end up with is total uh, instability where every time you get a new data point, you have to adjust the, the theory. Um, and so it's it actually, um, in the long run, um, much better not to, to try to get an exact fit with the data, uh, but to get a rough fit, but to have uh, equations that where you don't help yourself to uh, to any number of degrees of freedom that you need in order to get an exact fit, but you just maybe have a linear equation like here. I mean, it's because sometimes the, a linear equation really won't work, and you have to, to have, maybe have a quadratic equation or something like that. But but what the um, what the scientists are doing are is being very very stingy with um, with how much flexibility they're allowing themselves, and you know and how. How many uh, uh, parameters they can have in their equation? I mean, what what mathematically what degree it is, and, and uh, there are other kind of examples which work in slightly different mathematics slightly differently, but the, the overall effect is the same. But you, if you're really really stingy, you get these kind of approximate fits, but which, which are much more stable as new data comes in, and um, and so that's that's one big uh, reason. Um, why scientists don't like uh, having lots and lots of degrees of freedom because they, they've learned that it, it, you know, it's a kind of seductive way to go, but it, it just lands you in complete theoretical uh, instability. And so flexibility, the kind of flexibility that allows you to fit any kind of data is not a good thing from a scientist's point of view. Um, now, what I, I, I want to focus on is the question, well, so um, what implications might that have um, for philosophical methodology? And one comparison that, that might, maybe it might have already struck you, is that if you, if you look in areas of philosophy which are very, Counter example driven. You, know, for, and, uh, you find exactly the, the signs that the scientists tell you that overfitting is going on. Because what, what you get with overfitting is you get more and more complicated equations which are unstable because you, know, you get, quickly get new data in which requires you to change them. And uh, that's very like what happens in areas of philosophy where people are trying to. You know, to Provide analyses, necessary and sufficient conditions for um, you know philosophically interesting you know notions like knowledge and free will and uh, and so on um, because uh, um, you, you you're getting these more and more complicated analyses which are driven by new counterexamples and then there's these further complicated analyses. You know, there's a counterexample to them too, and, and so it has to be made even more uh, complicated. And it just, it just goes on in that, that way. And so, the, from a scientist's point of view, I think that looks like you know, a classic case of overfitting, of um, trying to be too respectful of the, uh, the data. Because, you see, what's going on with, with the, uh, this overfitting here is, that there's an error, some you know, some margin for error in the in the data. The data are not perfectly accurate, and and so the so the problem is if you if you over you know if you overfit, 
you're adjusting your theory to errors in the in the theory. Whereas um, by by keeping the, the degree of freedom low and just being willing, you know, to go for for a, a rough fit, you're actually kind of riding through the the errors in the uh, the data, um, and and so that suggests the the hypothesis that maybe something maybe we should be doing something similar to that in uh, in philosophy that we shouldn't be just as it were um, uncritically accepting every apparent counterexample that comes along and adjusting the theory to it because that's overfitting maybe we should uh, be looking um, for um, something that's you know a slightly more sophisticated methodology that's more critical in its handling of the the data. Now, of course, um, we, we need to some kind of uh, account of where the errors in the data might be coming from. In, because in philosophy, these data, and they're not just observational uh, errors in the same way that you get errors with measuring instruments in, uh, in, in science. I mean, the, 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 the data are, are philosophical counterexamples. Um, and so you might think, well, so where's the error there? I mean, some people might think here about uh, experimental uh, philosophy and its critique of the, the use of thought experiments uh, in, uh, in uh, philosophy. I'm, I, I mean, I can discuss that in the Q&A if, if you want, but I, I don't think that's the right approach. Um, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think the kind of blanket condemnation that you get from the uh, the negative program is at all helpful to what's going uh, on here. And also, uh, quite a lot of the counterexamples that uh, figure in, um, in philosophical discussion are, are not actually uh, thought uh, experiments. I mean, the, the fine example here is not a thought experiment. Um, so, I mean, you might also think, well, maybe we don't need a very specific source of uh, error because you know, we're fallible human beings and you know, so, um, so it, it's not surprising that we make mistakes uh, from time to time. Um, but the thing is, the kind of mistakes that are dangerous to the way philosophy proceeds, they're not individual errors where just one person messes up. Because, I mean, that would just be taken account of by the, the kind of normal way that philosophy proceeds where you know, other people just see that they mess up and, and, and you know, simply don't buy that kind of example. What, what I think is much more concerning is the possibility of um, errors that are kind of systematic um, and that are shared in the sense that, you know, all human beings or, or, or most normal human beings or something like that are subject to the same error, that so that it's, the error is in some way uh, more deeply built into the human uh, cognitive uh, system. Um, now, you know, if you just say that in the abstract, um, it, it seems a bit like a, just a kind of scare story. I mean, why should why should we, we, we worry about things like that? Isn't that just a kind of sceptical uh, concern? Um, but in fact. I think there's quite good reason to think that uh, some of our judgments that you know, are, are, were made you know, as attempted counterexamples and or you know, uh, made in reducing objections to philosophical theories are systematic because um, one feature of uh, human thought is, is that we use a lot of what are called by psychologists heuristics, which uh, you know, are sometimes described as um, cheap and dirty or uh, fast and frugal ways of solving problems or answering uh, questions. And these, these are, as it were, ways of doing things that, um, that get a, the correct answer most of the time, but are, are not at all, you know, in, in special circumstances will produce Error. So uh, one one indication of um, 
our reliance on heuristics. It's you know, all sorts of um, perceptual illusions. Because perceptual illusions are things that, you know, they, that pretty much all human beings are subject to. So it's not, it's not just, as it were, one particular uh, idiosyncratic person who's subject to them. It's just any, any normal person looking, looking at the world to be subject to the illusion. And these, these perceptual illusions are, you know, are likely to be explained by uh, some, some kind of uh, heuristic that we're relying on. So, uh, you know, one example of such a, a heuristic uh, is that we use um, the color edges, you know, as where places in our visual field where you go from, there's a sharp line between, like, you know, green and red or something like that. Um, we use those as indicators of the um, the boundaries of three-dimensional objects, and, and usually, you know, if it, it, you know, that's quite a good way of uh, of doing things. But it doesn't always work. I mean, there's been, after all, you know, the, the boundaries of the green and the and the white um, there don't, don't indicate any. Uh, I mean, the edge between green and white doesn't indicate any, any, anything in the uh, the shape of the uh, the object. And um, you know, something that plays on our use of this hu color heuristic for shapes is um, military camouflage, you know, where you, um, you, you can camouflage uh, all sorts of things by, by painting them in ways where the, where the color boundaries have no relation to the, uh, the shape of the uh, objects that you're uh, trying to uh, conceal. That's, that can be very, very uh, effective. Um, so, oh, but of course, that, it, it's not, that's not the kind of uh, heuristic specifically that, that we would need to worry about in philosophy, because when we're not talking about um, visual um, data uh, here. But and so the, the thing is, you know, are, are there, as it were, more intellectual heuristics that, that we uh, use? And um, I want to suggest that actually quite a lot of philosophical paradoxes are the result of um, our, our reliance on heuristics of various kinds, which we don't we don't we don't recognise them as if we're using them any any, any more than people you know automatically they may not recognise that they're using colour boundaries as um, indicators of the edges of objects, even though that is what they're doing. And you can't always reflect uh, just by introspection. You can't just work out what uh, heuristics you're uh, using. So I'll, I'll give some uh, examples uh, where I think that heuristics are actually producing philosophical difficulties. So um, one kind uh, have to do with the, the use of um, conditional statements of the form if if A, then uh, C. And um, I, that's actually what my book, Suppose and, and Tell, is, is sort of about. But the, the heuristic there is that, that when you're um, assessing a statement of the form, if A, then C, you, what you do is you suppose A, and then you know, supposing A, you, you then assess C, and you know, you accept it or you reject it or you give it a certain probability or whatever it is, and then you transfer that assessment from these, the, the kind of conditional assessment of C on the basis of A to an unconditional assessment of the conditional if A then C. Um, so for example, you know, if it, um, when you're assessing um, if, you uh, the conditional, uh, if my ticket won, then it, um, then it lost, that, that, that seems like a terrible conditional because on the supposition that it, um, it won, you, you, you're going to reject the claim that it, it lost and therefore you'll reject the conditional. Um, and the thing is, you can actually prove um, mathematically that that heuristic that, that we use in assessing conditionals, I mean, it, it's actually it's very useful, but uh, it's actually inconsistent, so it can't be completely correct. Um, it, it is just a heuristic. I, another example, I think, um, concerns um, heuristics in the case of 
um, vagueness. So a, a lot of the parallel writings, paradoxes of vagueness, they, they, they have to do with what are called tolerance principles. Like, you know, if um, you know, if n grains make a, a heap, then n minus one grains make a heap. And I think that's actually just based on a heuristic that we have. That when we when, when we're using vague language, um, if we've if we've assessed you know the the, the vague um, term like heap as applying in one case, then we're just going to to assume that it also applies in a very similar case. Um, and and the, the reason for that is just a practical reason. That if it means if, if you if you use that heuristic, you don't actually have to go back and look at the the, the, the thing you know when you've taken one grain away uh, to see whether it's it's still a, uh, a heap. You you just assume that it it is because it, the change was so so small. And so it, it's a very practical heuristic. But you know if it's taken uh, completely seriously as it is by by many philosophers, then you get a serratic paradox because you end up with the claim that. that when you only have one brain left, it's still a heap. Um, I think a, a third example um, is uh, one that if you if you know uh, Paul Kripke's paper, a puzzle about belief. He he has he talks about various principles that we use in determining what beliefs somebody has, which depend on um, what. What they say. So, if, as it were, if they were willing to, or, or what they assent to. So, if they're willing to assent to a sentence, then we take them as believing the corresponding proposition. And you know, most of the time, that's a completely sensible um, way of attributing belief. But for reasons that Kripke gives in that paper, you can find cases where it actually leads you into inconsistency. Uh, and so, it's it's just a heuristic. It's not something that is analytic or, or, or it certainly isn't 100% uh, reliable. And you know, I think also in the case of truth, where um, we get the liar paradox, um, which is based on uh, kind of disquotational principles, you know, along the lines that um, the sentence, grass is green, is true, if and only if grass is green. Uh, I think those are, we're basically using a, a heuristic uh, for uh, applying the notion of, of truth in that case. Um, and the fact that we get into the uh, live paradox is an indication that it is just a heuristic. Um, and I, I want to say something you know, about the, this intentional revolution, I mean, I don't have a huge amount of time, but um, I mean, here are, here are some I'll just, I think I'll just take one of, one sort of, it, uh, yeah, um, I'll, and I'll use G to abbreviate grass is, is green. Um, so, um, I mean, he, here are two sentences. Um, G because it's true, G, I, Grass is green. It's true that grass is green, or um, it's true that true that grass is green because grass is green. And I mean, this is a kind of asymmetry that Aristotle was already interested in. And so, uh, you know, Aristotle said, "Look, it, 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 it's true that grass is green because grass is green." It's getting things back to front if you think that grass is green because it's true that grass is green. I mean, because, as it were, the grass is what comes first, not the proposition that it's true. Um, and so it, and that's, a very, that's a very natural point uh, to make. And, um, you know, a, another, another similar pair would be um, that it seems like, um, you know, if you want to explain why grass is green and grass is green, that kind of stupid repetitive conjunction, You'd say, well, that's the case because grass is green. Um, you wouldn't say the other way around that grass is green because grass is green and grass is green. I mean, um, that that would be stupid, but they, but this is perfectly sensible. So, um, these, so these are cases which also have this kind of hyper-intentional feel to them because notice that it's true that grass is green; it's just equivalent, 
not necessarily equivalent to grass gooseberry. And so, so we're, we're actually, we're dealing with two, the two sides are, are necessarily equivalent, and, and with the conjunction case as well. So we're dealing with um, necessary equivalents, but yet it seems that which order we put them uh, in really makes uh, a difference. Um, so, so those are those are cases which look like you know get more uh, examples on Kip Fine's uh, side. But well, he, here's one more such uh, example. So uh, for this, you would need to know that that vixen just means female fox. So, and so we, supposing we've got a vixen, uh, let's call her Vera. Um, so this Vera is a vixen because. Um, Vera is a, a female fox. I mean, that seems, um, yeah, that is why Vera is a vixen. So that seems, that seems fine. Whereas Vera um, is a female fox. We're just doing the same trick of, of switching the order. Vera is a female fox because <laughs> Vera is a vixen. It, it sounds kind of silly. It's kind of like back to front. But the thing is, something is going wrong here because female fox and vixen, they're, they're actually synonymous. They, ha they just ha have exactly the same meaning. And, and so it really, if we, you know, certainly if we're just concerned with the actual metaphysical uh, relations, uh, the substituting um, female fox for vixen um, shouldn't, shouldn't make a significant difference because we're just, well, as we're, change, we're changing the word, but we're not changing the meaning. And, they, and so it, there shouldn't be any difference if we're, you know, if we're really not concerned with the words themselves between these two. And, and so it, it looks as though what's going on here is that we're getting some kind of I illusion of, as it were, of the cause relation um, that is probably based on a heuristic. And I think, in fact, it, 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 there's a kind of fairly natural candidate for what the uh, heuristic is. The heuristic. Um, is that that we judge a a because statement by um, the sort of helpfulness of the corresponding explanation, and so the explanation of the first would be, um, you know, uh, Vera is a female fox, so Vera is a vixen, uh, which seems like a, a good. E explanation because you're starting with the, the simpler things of female and fox and then putting them together to get vixen. Um, whereas Vera is a vixen, so Vera is a female fox. That seems to be going in the in the wrong uh, direction because you're starting with the more complex thing and then using that to explain the simpler bits. Um, and, and so there's a difference between the value of the corresponding explanations. But but that has to do with their just their cognitive usefulness. It doesn't have to do with anything uh, metaphysical. And I, I think it's quite plausible that, 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 that just the same thing is going on um, with the, the, the you know, it's true that G because G, that, that again, we prefer G, so it's true that G, because that's starting with something simple and then building up to something more complex. That, that seems much better than, than saying G, uh, sorry, it's true that, that grass is green, so grass is green. I mean, it would be okay in, in some kind of argument, uh, but, it, but it's not okay as an explanation because it's explaining the simpler thing in terms of the more complicated thing. But the, but the simplicity and the complexity, uh, it just you know, has to do with the, the, the verbal form, as, you know, as with female fox and uh, and fix, and you know all, all sorts of things can make an explanation you know 
good or bad, like, you know, just being um, the order in which you put th things can be more, you know, more helpful in one place way than a, a different order, e even when, as when nothing worldly is, is an issue. And so we're using this heuristic to, to judge these kind of metaphysical sounding uh, claims. And, uh, and but it, it sometimes leads us astray. And I think that is in fact the, probably what the explanation is for um, even the kind of original kit fine example about what's essential to uh, Socrates, because um, you know, the, the way that um, essence uh, it is typically thought of, including in the kind of Aristotelian tradition uh, uh, that that Fine is appealing to, is that the um, the essence of something it, uh, plays you know an explanatory role uh, in um, you know in, in uh, explaining. Uh, it's other properties. It's kind of central to explanations about the properties of the uh, object, and um, and so th that is Socrates obviously is going to be essential to all sorts of explanations about uh, Socrates' um, properties. I mean, that, that the person that we're talking about is Socrates, but um, th but that that he's a member of a singleton set of Socrates, that is not going to be uh, um, explanatory useful, it's just going to be uh, kind of clutter. And, uh, and therefore, it, um, the, 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 the second one d does not correspond to kind of good explanatory practice in the way that the first one does. But, but that doesn't mean that there's some metaphysical distinction going on. It's just that the way using this heuristic in judging things about essence, but, but in, in cases where it's unreliable. And, and so uh, what I'm suggesting is that we should have a very different attitude to, um, to counter examples in philosophy, that we should not be willing just to dump you know, fairly well-established theories because we have one a, a plausible sounding uh, parent counter example uh, to them because we, we need to think a lot more carefully about where the data are coming from and um, whether there's a danger, a serious danger, that the, the data are in fact artifacts of, of some kind of um, usually but not always reliable um, heuristic that uh, it's plausible that we uh, rely on. And so what I want to suggest, in particular in relation to the, the intentional, the hyper-intentional uh, so-called revolution, is that uh, it, it's based on uncritical um, treatment of data. And the, what we need to do in philosophy is to, to as it were, be less flexible in the way that um, the scientists prefer models with fewer degrees uh, of freedom and, and don't immediately dump them if the, the, the fit with the apparent uh, data isn't uh, perfect because um, that, that way just takes us down the, the dead end of uh, overfitting. And, and I'll stop there.
Um, so if I'm right in thinking that the, the thought is to do something more akin to like geography <coughs> and to make it less over 50, then what would the analogy of these erroneous data points be with counterpoint? So with a chart like this, you'd have you know something that's a bit off the line or you know generally it's still right, then we say, you know, those bits of data are fine, but if there's quite a lot of stuff and it's really off, we say, well, okay, maybe we need to rethink how we're, how we're modeling it. What would the analogy be with the counterexamples in philosophy? Which ones are kind of fit closely enough and which ones are enough to say, okay, we need to rethink them? Well, so, the, I mean, of course, I, I'm suggesting that, that, that these kind of finding and proposed counterexamples are cases uh, of... Um, data points that, that are uh, um, off, off the line. <laughs> um, and, um, and of course, there's a question, well, so how do we identify which ones are off the line? Well, the, the idea is um, we just shouldn't be so quick to think that, that intentionalism, you know, which is a very long-standing um, and powerful uh, theory with lots of implications, you know, m m which, the, most of which are, you know, are, are, are true, um, you know, I mean, I'm regarded on all hands as, uh, as true. Um, and so, um, the, we, we, you know, we've got a theory which is doing pretty well, and so we've all, we've, in effect, we've got this, this line, and then we're getting some, some data points which seem to be, um, you know, off the line. But, you know, th that's that's a reason for suspicion. You know, we sh you know, just as in science. I mean, you know, scientists they don't. You know, as soon it's not that they throw out a theory as soon as you know they, there's some kind of anomalous result. They you know, they look more carefully and, and they're, they're much they're, they're much more cautious about um, about throwing out theories and they're, and they're particularly cautious about throwing out. Theories and then and then adopting ones which uh, have have lots of degrees of extra of, of freedom because you know they know that 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 um, goes in a bad direction. Thank you for that. I really enjoyed your lecture. I just wondered about exhibit line twelve. Can you just assume the atomism um, with that error? So like, can intellectual noise just add up to the factors um, in intellectual? Yeah. So, so this, as well as random noise, which where the the errors just tend to cancel out, and um, and I think that's that's in a way relatively easy to to deal with in in philosophy because if if we just think of the random noise as being you know individuals messing up because then they will get overruled by you know the, the sensible majority. Um, but I think the, you know, it, it's not that all data errors in science are just the result of random noise. Some of them are the result of systematic errors. I mean, you know, for, so for example, you know, there may be a measuring instrument which just doesn't work properly in certain conditions because, you know, there, there, there's some kind of interference factor that hasn't been taken account of. And, and so I, so I think that that the kind of heuristics that I'm talking about, that, that what they're doing is they're um, the, these are systematic error factors, you know, which we're not we're not going to get rid of them just by repeating the experiment and so on, because you know we're all it's going you know when we look keep looking at these examples, we we're all humans with roughly the same heuristics in our heads, and, and so we're, we're going to keep on you know saying well yeah this looks like a pretty good example, and so. So that's that's where we we just ha have to um, well do the in a way the kind of thing that scientists would, would do because I mean they you know when when something more systematic with kind of is going wrong I mean they they start to look for where systematic errors in observation might come you know like as I say like things like in, you know some some factor that's interfering, you know, and would interfere in the same way, you know, if you repeated the experiment and that kind of thing. And so, so and, I, and I think the way that we should be doing that is by, 
sort of thinking more carefully about, about where these judgments um, of individual examples are coming from. And I, you know, I think it, it's not, they're not just mysterious things. I, you know, I think it's, it's very often possible to identify what, what heuristics we're, we're using and, you know, and even to see why these heuristics are actually quite sensible things to, to use on, on the whole and ones which will you know, often give us um, good information but, but at the same time it's clear that there's a risk involved and, and that we shouldn't just think that, that, they, that the answers they give will always be correct. And so, I, so I think it's you know, just a matter of, as we're reflecting a bit more on, on where these judgments are coming from, what, why it is that, that, we're, that we're making them. Because I think you know, that's something that, that is, uh, is open to, to discovery. I mean, it's, of course, it's partly a psychological question, but it's a psychological question with a lot of philosophical significance. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Miguel, um, a master's student here. Um, I think that I, I agree um, in general with the line of your argument, but I, I guess that my worry is how do we distinguish heuristics from like bias? Because it seems to me that if we take this in a bit more of a social realm, then it might be just it might be difficult just to differentiate what is our heuristic from interpretation of data and what is just our bias that we've just been programmed into. And that just doesn't seem to be like an easy thing to distinguish between when we get to counter examples or just the problematics of some theories that we may encounter and that are well established. Yeah, well, but there isn't necessarily a, a, a sharp distinction between, between bias and heuristics. Because, I mean, you know, a lot of bias comes from stereotypes. Mm -hmm. But if you, you know, if you think about the kind of knowledge that you know a non-specialist has let's say of natural kinds of you know plants and animals and so on an awful lot of that is to do with stereotypes mm -hmm. you know like tigers have stripes and and so on and 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 so you know of course in certain cases where where we have you know negative stereotypes of groups of human beings that, that um, uh, I mean, then, then they, those can do serious damage, mm -hmm. and um, and and of course, th th then we're likely to call them uh, biases. Mm -hmm. um, but but they're not in necessarily in origin so different from you know a lot of our world world knowledge, which you know because you know a lot of our knowledge of animals, for example, comes just from you know kind of hearsay and from um, you know reading fairly popular books and, and so on. Um, and so, so I think that in a sense, what, what I'm, the things that I'm talking about are, are the, the biases that, that are inherent in heuristics. I mean, because, um, you know, the, you know, even, even in an example like, like the use of camouflage, um, in a sense, camouflage is exploiting a kind of bias that we have, which is actually, that bias in, in Many ways, it's it's a very valuable one because it's, it enables us to divide the world into uh, three-dimensional objects. But but it, but because it's uh, has its bias, it's also you know in predictable circumstances, it's going to uh, send us in the wrong direction. So I don't I don't think that we should we should necessarily be trying to separate you know completely heuristics and uh, and biases. But um, we're just um, you know, because I think it's too simple to think. Well, the biases—they're the evil stuff, mm -hmm. and then the heuristics—they're the kind of, kind of fairly good stuff. And, and so there can't be any connection between them. I mean, I think uh, to you know a, a kind of a disconcerting extent, they're coming from exactly the same place. Thank you. Okay. No, I'm Eric. Um, so I've got a, a question about where the instability comes in. Yeah. So we over, in science, we overfit. We're fitting to um, random errors, noise in the data, but also systematic errors. Um, my understanding was that the instability here, um, if we're making systematic errors and we're fitting to those systematic errors, but we continue to make those systematic errors, while our theory will be wrong, it won't be unstable, in that we're going to keep on getting new data points that also have those systematic errors. 
Um, so it seems that it's the random errors that give us the instability. But in philosophy, uh, we've got these random errors, but we're very good at weeding them out because you know, we talk to each other and we realize, oops, I made a mistake. So if our overfitting in philosophy is generally a result of overfitting to systematic errors, and these are systematic errors we continue to make, uh, how does this lead to yeah. instability yeah. in philosophy? Or is the instability something that's so, separate? So I think that even you know, the, the, the random errors, if, you know, if, if, you, if you're very strict about uh, maximum fit, you, even the random errors are enough to send you uh, off in the wrong direction. But, um, but any, any systematic errors will, will also um, kind of, they'll, they'll lead um, to, um, they're likely to lead to, to instability because, because they'll, be sending, they'll be sending the curve in directions which have to do with, you know, for example, you know, maybe there's a zone where, you're, where your measuring instrument is unreliable, but which is not kind of typical of the behavior. And so, so that, will, that, that will also, um, you, you know, you, you'll, um, that's likely to, to send off your, um, your, your curves in, in ways, you know, which, which, because, because you're building in, you know, over sensitivity to your measuring instruments. And then, for example, if you use like different measuring instruments with, with a, you know, whose systematic error is a bit different, you know, then you'll have to revise for that. So I think in, um, in, the, in science, it's, it's all kinds of errors can produce this over, overfitting. And, and then, as, as you said, I mean, I, the, the ones that I'm most concerned with and that I think are the hardest to deal with in philosophy are the, the systematic errors, not the, the random errors. But, but for similar reasons, they, you know, they will, um, they're, they're, going to, they're going to send off um, the, um, you know, the, 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 the theory in the wrong direction, you know, because um, in, in, in the example, in all the examples that I've been talking about, um, the effect of these, of the, the areas where the heuristic is unreliable is that it actually, um, you know, if you really press, it leads to inconsistency. And, you know, and so of course, you know, we're not going to be able to, you know, if we're trying to, to, to um, you know, get a theory to, to model um, data that are coming from an inconsistent heuristic. We're, we're not going to, that's not going to be any uh, stable um, resting point. We have time for one more very quick right. question. Um, thank you. Uh, hello, uh, I'm a neuroscience student here. So uh, I think there is a distinction to be made on its uh, terminological issue. So the analogy here you suggested was that in science uh, uh, people don't want overfitting, and overfitting is an uh, indicator of high uh, degrees of freedom, right? Yeah. But I think I think actually actually if you think about it math mathematically, uh, it's a, a linear a linear model and uh, this fuzzy fuzzy model. Uh, so a linear model is like more. Of it's, it's got less parameter, yeah. and it should be of actually lower, uh, lower a, a lot lower uh, degrees of freedom than this this crazy crazy curve. So I think um, yeah, well that's that's actually what I was saying. I mean, that, that, so that I, I, mean, I completely agree with that. So um, the, it's the, the scientist attitude is keep the degree degree of freedom as low as you as low as you can get away with, and it's having a, it's because, you know, it's, it's if, you, if you allow yourself a very high degree of freedom, then you get this crazy curve, right? So, so the, the, what the scientists are doing is they're avoiding the crazy curve by insisting that the degree of freedom uh, must be low, i.e. that you can't have, you know, an equation with, you know, x to the 12th, you know, plus the b, you know, x to the 11th, blah, 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 blah. blah. Uh, you know, and so, so you can't you can't have a dozen degrees of freedom, um, and um, and so so the ban on on a high degree of freedom is it, kind of forcing us. In this simple case, it will just be forcing us to to um, to um, 
to try to, to fit it with as best we can with a linear equation. I mean, you know, and then uh, there will be some cases where that it just becomes too clear that that is not good enough, or where you know we have to go, you know, give ourselves one or two x degree three. So I, what you were saying just seemed like, seemed like you, we were agreeing actually. But Sorry, no follow-up questions. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's a good place to end. Thank you so much again for joining us. Um, yeah,